Yes, One thing about Brother Wayne, you never know what you're going to get, but you can be rest assured it's not going to be scary. Man. All right, from the back row, what is one thing y'all got as soon as y'all are done? We'll start. The intermission. And we're still eating. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm here for you, ma'am. He asked me a question. Just answer it. Can we get you any I'm in trouble. It's already I gone. I think we have the mobile masseuse coming. Is that okay? <laughs> Do you All right, back. There she goes again. What in the world? Would you control your wife? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> he, he just shakes his head and keeps on drinking. <laughs> What's in your cup? <laughs> it's all on all right. video. Back, back row. Back row. Back row. One thing that you've gotten. Back row. Just one thing so far that you've learned. One thing. Back row. Don't make me call somebody, Faith. Don't make me do that. Three. Yes, ma'am. Can we look at our notes? Oh, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 Now, five minutes or less. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's so a church bad. Joke. What have y'all been smoking, chewing? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, no, speaking, I, I'm just speaking of it. I'm not sure what happened at the Mason <laughs> restaurant, but that We're was not sweet I didn't tea. go there. We're in the same I didn't get place. invited. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, she's bitter. Okay, I'd like yeah. to comment when you said sh- put down the rocks. You know, yeah. you quit condemning each other and throwing each other. Oh, yeah, I man. just like that. I thought that was really good because, you know, sometimes we don't look at each other the way we should. That's right. I agree with we you. act emotionally. Rather than, you know, we let the emotions come out before we think sometimes. Mm-hmm. So. I believe it was, was it you, my brother, that had that place, what goes around, comes yeah, around? Yeah. It was neat. They went to a store, and you know how we saw the cycles and your, your notes and all? There was literally a plate that has what goes around arrow, comes around arrow, and it had the arrows. I told him what he needed to do was get and do that etching or whatever, love, love and respect retreat 2019 or keep right. that in remembrance. How much it costs? Because we get into, I don't, I'm not sure, I think it's like $19.99. What you say, But what happened, now watch this, because I, 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 I want to take about 30 minutes, because y'all, y'all have listened good, and I've been on the other side, and uh, it, it's not a whole lot of fun sitting there this long, and I, I, I just don't like it, so I want to be conscious of that. But see what happens, we get in these cycles, and with some marriages, they're in those cycles, and Again, we, we, we have facades. We give people what they want to see. But what I want to do is get beyond the facade and, and really talk to you, talk to your heart, talk to what's going on in your marriage, talk about what's going on in your heart. Because some marriages feel like they're, they're in a cycle, and it's a crazy cycle, and they're never going to get out of it. They, they just can't break out of it. They may break out of it for a day or for a season, but it's like it always comes back, and it just lords over them. And so I want you to understand that there's hope with this, and there's hope in our marriages. Amen. But it takes work, and it right. takes a, it takes a conscious decision on our part as as husband, as wife, to apply what we're learning. This will do you no good if we treat it like the what, the, the, the the popular thing at the first of the year. At the first of the year, everybody's gonna gonna go on a diet, and that usually lasts until lunch. <laughs> I mean that. We, we are. We, we, we make these decisions, we make these um, resolutions, and they usually don't last. And so we come to marriage retreats and we're like, you know, that was good stuff. And during the marriage retreat, we find that there's a, there's a closeness, there's a, uh, a connection between the husband and wife. But then we go home and the kids are acting up. And when you get home, you've got something that is broken in the house. And now the schedule, and now the work, and now the pace, and now all the stuff that you left behind, it's, it's right there, back into your life. And if you don't take this stuff and consciously work on these things, I like hearing you joke around, uh, I forgot what all the discourse and banter was in the back, but I enjoy hearing you, you, you talk and start saying, well, I lovingly said this to her, well, I respectfully said this to him. <laughs> because what it showed, we, we laugh about that, and we want it to be fun. Laughter doeth good, the Bible says, like a medicine, okay? But what that's showing is, there's terms now that we're getting into our vocabulary, and there are thought processes that are getting into our mind, Amen that as we approach one another and as we interact with one another, maybe something that has not been, well, clear to us before, now it's in our conscience. Now it's in our our, our patterns. And we want to keep these things in the pattern of our life. True story. Think about love and respect. 
a couple have been married for 10 years and the husband was not one that was always given to remembering special days and doing special things. And so the 10 year anniversary comes around and the wife didn't say anything. She said, I want to just see if he will remember that we're having an anniversary. And so she didn't say a word. Well, the husband on the other end, he remembered the anniversary and he went to the card shop and he starts looking through all the cards and he starts reading through the messages. And boy, he picks up a card and he's like, that right there, that is the message that I want to give to my wife. He was so proud of himself. He took the time, he got the card, he, he had it ready, he got home a little bit early, put it uh, on the table next to the flowers that's on the table, leaned it against there, put his wife's name on it, he even drew little, little, little hearts around it. I mean, he, he thought, hey, you know what, home run, right? And she comes in, and man, she looks on the table, and there's a beautiful card, colorful, he drew hearts. She's thinking, he remembered. And she opens up the card. And she starts reading the card. And at first there was a smile on her face. And then all of a sudden the man is watching his wife and her face drops like she has stepped off of a cliff. She's like, what in the world? He's like, what do you mean? I can't believe you gave me this card. He's like, what do you mean? He's totally taken aback. What do you mean? I mean, this card said everything. I read through all these cards. This card said everything that I wanted to say for our 10 year anniversary. She's like, yes, a great card. If it was my birthday. It was a birthday card for their 10th anniversary. And so all of a sudden, she starts feeling unloved. He felt totally disrespected and they jumped on the crazy wheel and didn't get off now should the man have read all the card and paid attention yes but let me ask you a question did that man hate his wife did that man not love his wife was that man not thinking about his wife now i'm not condoning if you men go out for your anniversary and give her a birthday card and put p.s from brother tony okay <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I'm saying, amen. But what I'm saying is this, sometimes a man may, may make an effort that may not be flawless. It may not be perfect. That husband, it wasn't a matter that he didn't love his wife. It wasn't a matter that he wasn't thinking about his wife. But all of a sudden, her feeling unloved, she throws down on him, rips his face slap off, and so now, now we've got it going. She's unloved. He's disrespected, she feels unloved, uh, she, he's, he's disrespected, and it's going to go around and around and around, and it's not funny, and it's not a joke, and they go to bed angry with each other. And so when we talk about love and respect, I'm telling you, we've got to take a step back and look deeper into actions and situations within our relationships than things that are just on the surface. Because, ma'am, there may be some stuff that awkwardly, some men, some men are romantics. Some men, they just, it just naturally flows out of them and they're very, very, very good with it. Mm -hmm. Other men are, are um, cavemen. Um, they are... What are you looking at me? <laughs> what? What'd you say? What are you looking at me for? Because <laughs> we don't have you, Jack. <laughs> what? No, what you don't drag on the ground. What'd you say? <laughs> I think she ain't been. What'd you say? <laughs> She, knuckles don't drag on the ground. She, okay, wait a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll sum this up. This back table's in trouble. respectfully. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't leave, brother. Her, don't face, leave. her face is red. He's taking his jacket on. Take your notebooks quickly. <laughs> we want to save this marriage, okay? He's the ex state trooper. Yeah, make sure there's no guns. Okay. We love and so, you. so... Some, some of them are not going to be as comfortable doing those things as other men are. And what I was trying to say before I was once again respectfully interrupted. What I was saying was, don't make it where your, your husband has got to act like and be what other women say that well, their husband did. And men, don't make it where your wife is compared to and has to act like what another woman, the other husband say, well, my wife did, and fill in the blanks. Find the value and the worth and the beauty that's in your relationship. And though the efforts may, well, they, they, may, may, they may be clumsy, realize the effort that went into doing for you 
what was done. Amen. So we look at this thing. We look at couple. We look at the things that will energize the marital relationship. And this morning, this afternoon, and tonight we're dealing with the, the, the wife and the things that will energize her tomorrow morning. We'll deal with the husband and what will energize him. And then we'll close out with the rewards of all this and the beauty of all this. So C, from our notes this, this morning, C, what was the first thing that's going to help you energize your wife? What is the, what is the C there? It is closeness. closeness. Somebody give me something about closeness. Somebody give me something about closeness. Read from your notes if you need to. What is give me one thing about closeness? God's plan. Huh? It's God's plan. Okay, it's definitely God's plan. When does your wife feel you're close to her? When does your wife feel like you're close to her? When you invest in your relationship. Okay, I think that's very good. When you invest in the relationship. When else when, when does your wife feel like you're close to her? When you hug her. Hug, talk, okay. When you snuggle. When you snuggle. Snuggle. Okay. Um Anything? What else? Talk to me. When, did, when does your wife feel like you're close to her? I got it right here. <laughs> when you put her first. Uh, yeah, when you put her oh, first. We're gonna go, that's, that is a, a, a real strong point that we're going to bring out in another point in a minute. So when you, when you invest in her, you hug, you snuggle, you, you're, you're talking with each other. Well, what's another thing? When does your wife feel like you're close to her? When does your wife feel like you're close to her? And you notice that I'm starting to accentuate something. When does your wife feel like you are close to her. And what you need to do is you can't just go by these notes. You need to have conversations. And you need to ask your wife, what is it that I do that makes it feel like, in your opinion, because hers is the only one that matters, what is it that I do in our relationship that makes you feel like I am closer to you than ever before? What, what can I do to bridge any space between us? What can I do to help you to realize I want to be close to you? Ask your wife. And ladies may be sitting here thinking, golly, I, I just don't know. Then think about it. What is, what is it that your husband could do? What is it that you need in your life that's going to make it where there's not a distance between you, but where there's closeness? Closeness. And so the C, closeness. What's the next one? O. What was the, what's the next one? O is for? Openness. All right, what's some ways that you can show openness? What's some ways that you can show openness? Listen. Huh? Listen. Okay, listen. What else? How can you how can you show op openness? By by learning to express his feelings. Like um, okay, this is I'm not trying to be personal, but like Travis, when he's upset about something, his way of expressing that is to clean house. I mean. It can be perfect. You not the notes? No. Nope. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that is his way. And I, house, I mean, me, I mean, I mean if I'm upset, hey. y'all know it comes out that. Yeah. I mean, I'm just honest with him, you know. But if he would learn to just talk instead, it would be so much easier. Okay. But one of the neat things about what you just said is that you've been observant enough of your husband to know that when he's trying to yeah. take that step, that the way that he does that step is by this action. Yeah. And that's sweet in marriage that you are noticing what he's trying to do. Now you're saying, as you have taken that step, which is an absolutely wonderful step, the next one would be, and that's where you go from step to step. So Travis, that, that is, I think that's pretty, pretty awesome in y'all's marriage. I think that's sweet. I think that's very good. And so there's an open. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think everybody here is going. Uh, hey, Travis. Uh, <laughs> really, can we fight for you come to my house? You know? so, all right. So openness. What else? What else about openness? Talk to me. What else about openness? What else about openness? I like the note about pray together. I think that's a yeah. real vulnerability for men, you know. Well, I, I, I think if we, if I had a bell, I'd be dinging it right now. Yeah. I think that is money. That's just that's money, okay? Maybe when you discuss like everyday stuff with her, you know. Uh, brother, I, I, again, if I had a bell, I think I'd ring it. That's I think that's very very good, yeah, guys. Good. I think it's very good. What else? Give her full attention. Mm -hmm. Real good. Real good. Um, yeah, don't just say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> As you're clicking the remote yeah, yeah. and the response. Yeah. 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 Just because somebody's been married a certain length of years does not mean that their marriage is close. It doesn't mean that their marriage is good. Years guarantee nothing. Silly illustration. 
and I know we, we cut up a lot, but you know, in the game, let's just take the game of golf. The game of golf, guys like me, I may go, I may go twice a year now at the most, but, the, but when I play, I'm, I'm never going to get any better because all I do is continue doing the wrong things I've done all my life. My, my score is never going to get better. I could play all the time, but if I don't change my swing, I'm not going to change my game. And what happens in marriage is people have the years invested, but not the work. There's not been the changes, and changes are difficult. And so we laugh, and we're dealing with how the men can be open to their wives. Some of them are very uncomfortable with that. Some of them feel that that is very threatening. Some of them do not want to share that. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why we run away from it. And as men, what we've got to, we've got to ask <clears throat> ourselves is, why do I act in such a way to divert attention from me not being open with my wife. What is it that I am challenged with in my life that makes it where I don't want to share fully with Stacy? And so we divert with humor, we divert with a lot of other things, but when we bring all of this back around and we're really going to focus in on how can I be not only close to my wife, but how can I have openness with my wife? Where I am sharing with her the depths of my soul. It was said of Samson that where Samson messed up, was not in a lot of things that we think that Samson messed up, though those things were wrong. I'm talking about the core thing where Samson messed up with Delilah. It's when Del he told Delilah, and I believe the, the expression is, he told Delilah all his heart. And Delilah was able to get Samson to open up like nobody else did, to reveal the deepest of secrets within his life. And when he did that, now... It cost him. But men in your life, in our life, we've got to ask ourselves, what is it that's challenging us from telling our wives all of our heart? And though Samson's story didn't turn out the way we wanted it to, in our Christian marriages, when we are able to share our heart and really connect with our wives, we have a marriage that has depth to it. You've heard the expression that something is 10 miles long and an inch deep, and that's the average Christian marriage. Sorry. Take how many years you've been married, and that's how long it is. And then ask yourself this question, what is its depth? What is the depth of our relationship? What is the depth of our communication? And where closeness comes in, and where openness comes in, is we're not looking at making it that much longer, we're looking at making it that much deeper. And we're really getting to the heart of the things that we struggle with within our relationship. I. I, you, I'm talking for us men, that we would be able to say, I can share anything with my wife and it's not going to come back and bite me. Ladies, if your husband does share with you and he is open with you, one of the worst things that you could ever do, you will hurt your marriage if not kill it, is if your husband takes that step from this conference, and this, we, we, we've now left the joke inside of this thing. If your husband from this conference starts sharing with you the depths of his soul and things that he has never shared before, and you share it with somebody else at church, you're the cause of this marriage going down the toilet. Because I can assure you this, if it's taken this many years to get him to open up in a conference and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit has worked deeply within his heart, and then you go start sharing stuff that he told you and you alone, he will never share anything else with you again. And that's the problem with some men in here is you had somebody in your life that you shared something with. Maybe it was a parent, a coach, a teacher, maybe it was a former wife, not sure. But you had somebody that you shared with. You shared the depths of your soul. You laid it all out. You, you were, and this is, men don't like this next word, and that next word is vulnerability. You became vulnerable to somebody. You laid yourself open. You were open. You were um, uh, just totally honest with them. And it came back and it bit you. And what you said is this, first time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. And a lot of men live in the realm of, they tried this once, whatever amount of time ago it was, they tried this once, they said, you know what? Been there, done that, laid it all out. You know what it got me, preacher? It got me the biggest heartache of my life. And so now what we have in our relationships is walls. We're very guarded. We're very protective. We are going to make sure that we have this survival instinct. And we're going to make sure that we survive. And we throw up those walls, and we close those gates, 
and we measure out just how close we'll let anybody get in our lives. Openness is one of the most beautiful things in a marriage relationship. And open, openness is one of the things that most marriages will never experience. If you want to look in your marriage and ask how much do you trust one another, then ask yourself the question, how open and honest can you really be with your wife or husband? And so men, the ladies have a great need, a great need to know your feelings, a great need to know what you're thinking, a great need to know your plans, a great need to be a part of your life, to be very open with them. We were in Sunday school, and before Sunday school, people were coming in. There was a man named Wes that was part of our home. I stole it from Brother Wayne. We had a home improvement Sunday school class back then. And he came in, and he was bragging. <coughs> and what he was bragging about was he had gone and bought a house. And what made it so funny, and he was just sharing it around and thought it was just the funniest thing in the world, is he had went and bought a rental home and hadn't even told his wife. And when she found out about it, it's when he put her in doing the same thing, expecting different results. One man said that is the definition of insanity. That we're going to do the same thing, expecting different results. And so in our marriage, you say, Preacher, I'd like to have a better marriage. I'd like to have a closer marriage. I'd like to have a marriage that honors God, glorifies God. I'd like to have a marriage that I enjoy in the sense of all the biblical reward that we read about marriage. I'd like to experience that within my heart and within my life. Preacher, I'd like to have that within my life then you've got to be committed to making the decisions and making the changes and making yourself vulnerable once again to take the steps that's going to build your marriage to have the depth that God wants your depth to have, God wants your marriage to have. Does that make sense? Amen or no? Y'all with me? And so how, what kind of depth does your marriage have? And so the, the openness will help to, help to deepen that. On your outlines there, you have your wife uh, feels you are open to her when you share your feelings. You say, let's talk, ask her about what she's feeling and ask her for her opinions. Uh, you face shows you want to talk, relax body language, good eye contact. You take her out for a walk and talk. You reminisce about how you met or perhaps you talk about the kids and problems she may be having with them. You pray with her. You give her your full attention. And here, here we go with the, what was said in the back there. No grunting responses while trying to watch TV, read the news for her, write emails. Uh, you, discuss, you discuss financial concerns, possible job changes, or ideas for your future. You're making decisions together because, remember, you're a team. You're not competing. You've heard this many times. You're not competing. You're complimenting one another. Sure. You're one team. So we have closeness. We have openness. You. We're going to go through the word couple real quick. We've got about 12, 15, maybe 35 minutes left. <laughs> you. Just make sure you all listen. You. Understanding. Understanding. This one right here, I'd like to go through very quickly and go to the next one because I, I don't like this one at all. Don't try to fix her. Just listen. And even as I'm putting this together, I'm like, oh, can, I'm like, is there any way to spell couple without you? <laughs> Understanding. Yeah, good luck. Well, we, we can do it in Spanish, okay? But watch this. We men have a tendency of wanting to fix things. Within, there's a lot of men that within 30 seconds of you saying what's going on, he's already he's already has a resolution in his mind of how to fix it. And the hardest thing, remember, we got blue glasses and pink glasses. One of the hardest things in the world for a man to understand is somebody talk about a problem and really not want anybody to fix it, but just listen to the problem. It blows men's minds. It'd be like, it makes about as much sense to a man as you driving around with a car that has mechanical problems and not fixing it. It drives a man crazy. If there's something that's broke, we fix it. It's, we got to get it fixed. If we can't fix it, we'll get somebody to fix it. But you don't have broke stuff all the time. And so when mama comes and she's talking about a situation, the man's thinking, okay, well, if you just do, if you just do this, I mean, you know, you're getting on my nerves with this thing. I mean, if you just do this, we wouldn't have to talk about it for three days. But part of this understanding is where you don't want to talk about it for three days, she needs to talk about it for three days. It's going to drive you crazy. And that's part of us understanding she's looking through pink, we're looking through blue, but we're going to come together and look through purple. And we're going to bring these two worlds together because, see, we love each other enough that we're going to try to understand where the other person's coming from. So many times things are different. And one thing that I've learned the older I've gotten is just because something is different, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just different. And our wives, men, they're not wrong. By no stretch are they wrong. Are they different? Yes. And that's one of the beauties of the magnets being attracted without opposing forces if we're, we're attracted together. And you understanding her 
um, 1 Peter 3, 7. 1 Peter 3, 7, beautiful, so much, so much good Bible here, but likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. You're to, you're to know your wife. You're to know how she functions and how she thinks and what makes her happy and what makes her sad and what are her mannerisms. And you're taking time to be a student, men of your wife. Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. See, ladies, when we talk about you need to respect a man, it doesn't mean that the man's not respecting you. We're talking about the core values of a man and woman. For the woman is love. For the man is respect. But when your man loves you, he's going to give honor to you. He's, he's, he's going to cherish you. He's going to lift you up. He's going to exalt you. And so husbands were to dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as into the weaker vessel. I'm not talking about just the, the physical weakness and the differences. We're in a day and age where if you look at some women and go, you are the weaker vessel, she'd punch you in the nose. Uh, we're, we're, just in a, we're, we're, we're in a crazy day and age. That is talking about something that is so fine, so priceless, that you hedge it with care. It is the mean china that you do not just haphazardly toss around. It is something of great worth and great value. She's the weaker vessel, the precious vessel. Because it says, you're being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. This is a, a, a team, and we're, we're, we're equal before for the God of heaven, and we have different roles, and God has made it where the man is the leader of the house and the authority of the home, and it doesn't mean that there's no value or no worth there with the woman. And so we're to give, not, we're, we're to treat them with, with great respect, with, with great gentleness, with great care. Um, it's not just uh, something that we just haphazardly handle. We, we treat them with, with great concern, with great love. And we understand what they're going through. We understand what they're, why they're doing what they're doing. And the men's byline is, man, you can't understand these women. Good night. And then we have books like um, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus and all these kind of things. Yes, we're different, but it doesn't mean that we can't, we can't take steps to connecting with and trying to understand the helpmate that God has given us. We look within this thing. Look at your notes. It says closeness and oneness are very similar, and one, pe one will play off the other. Understanding plays off of closeness and openness. And so as we're building closeness and as we're building openness, all of a sudden there's going to be that desire to understand. There's going to be that desire to be able to connect with and see where they're coming from. Why, I want you to look at me just for a moment. Why do they do what they do? Why do they say what they say? Why do they react the way that they react? What is it that makes them do what they do? And we're going to deal with understanding. And when we're dealing with our wives, men, again, I'm the world's worst at it. Um, in counseling, 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 uh, I like preaching. I don't think I like counseling. Um, because with counseling, it's like people come in and they want you to give permission for them to do what they want to do, but they don't want to make any changes in their life. And I think counseling has got, got to be one of the biggest wastes of time in the world. That's because I'm changing how I do some of mine. It's just because, again, why? I'm a fixer. Now, if you need somebody that can just sit and talk to you for five hours, I'm looking at the lady going, you need to take this home and talk to your husband. I'm not your husband. See, I'm a, in counseling, I, I struggle. In marriage, I struggle because Stacy brings and says, okay, I've got this. And, and she wants to... Have you ever noticed this? A man says, Hey, Vinny, you got a watch? Okay. Is there a man? Okay, Vinny, look at, look at you. What time is it, Vinny? 8 o'clock. Thank you, buddy. When, when a man asks a man what time it is, it's 8 o'clock. When a man asks a woman what time it is, <laughs> they build a clock. <laughs> and then they tell you what time it is. Does <laughs> anybody understand what I'm saying? How many of you have ever looked at your wife, asked her a question, and 10 minutes later you still don't got the answer? And, you, and all of a sudden your eyes are glazed over, your mouth is hung, your tongue's out the side of your mouth, and you got. God, what? And, and the man forgot what he asked. <laughs> it's, called, it's called women. I look at my wife sometimes. And she's got this thing, and she's going into the details. And, and, and my impatience, and this is a weakness of mine, my, my impatience jumps out. And I'm like, just uh, listen, can we skip all this? Get, get to what I need to hear. Does that work? Is that, is, that, is that understanding? Is that drawing her close to me? Now watch this. The man's side is, I can, if you just tell me I'm going to handle this, because I'm, I'm a man, I'm going to take care of this. But now, when I respond like that to my wife, my wife takes that as unloving. Because what my wife needs me to do 
is let's just say I've got to work out a situation with one of the children. Let's just say maybe we're dealing with insurance. And what I need is I need, I need, I need the five facts that uh, I'm dealing with. We're going to go get a plan. We'll take care of this. We'll call it whatever we need to do. Uh, we'll, there's, just, there's just a real simple flow of getting this thing done. Well, the way my wife wants to do it is she wants to talk about the caseworker and the caseworker just, just uh, has a kid and that child's three years old and it's got red hair and it's wearing stride right shoes and they went to the chili uh, chilies for supper and all of a sudden she's telling about the caseworker she's telling about the dogs and she's telling about this and she's telling about this and I'm sitting there going what it's the what does this have to do with me fixing the problem I want to fix the problem and so sometimes when it comes to marriage, you, you can be looking at them and because we're men and we're, we're going to look through the blue glasses or ladies are going to look through the pink glasses and we're going to sit there and they just, they, just, they, just, they just want to talk. See, ask yourself this question. Does your wife think that you care enough to, to listen? Well, I provide for her. That's not what I ask. I gave her a house. That's not what I asked. She's got a car. I, that's not what I asked. She's got groceries. That, that's not what I asked. See, as a man, we provide the home. We're going to provide a car. We provide the food. We provide the protection. Anybody comes in the house, we're going to jump out of bed. We're going to grab, uh, we don't, you know, as Christians, we don't have guns in our houses. But we're going to grab something that sort of looks like that. And, uh, <laughs> are you with me? Uh, and so what, 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 I'm saying, what I'm saying is, you know, we're the men. We're, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to do this, right? But that's not what she asked. That's not what is asked. Do you care enough, do I care enough to listen to my, you listening to your wife? Even when they're going to go down so many rabbit trails that even they're going to get lost. How many times have they gone through this thing and you try to sit there and listen to this thing and they looked at you and started laughing going, ha, ha, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> and you're sitting there going, because I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> Are y'all with me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Understanding. <laughs> Just listening. Being able to paraphrase back to her what you heard her say, I have found that uh, most people's listening skills are very inept, very weak. And knowing how my mind works, what I do is when somebody's talking to me, I'm repeating in my mind everything they're saying. That's the only way I can stay in a conversation. If you're talking to me, and there's, there's somebody doing something over here, somebody's doing over something over here, and there's a conversation going over there. Uh, I can listen to four conversations at one time. I, I want to listen to four conversations at one time. But as a pastor, my people don't want me to listen to four conversations at one time. When we listen to one conversation. And so what I've had to do in my life, because my mind just has a way of just doing just a lot of things. While they're talking, I'm repeating what they're saying in my mind as they're talking to me, trying to listen, trying to focus on what is going on in this conversation so that when it gets to the end of it, I can be able to spit back to them what they talked about. I've been in conversations where they were talking, they lost their place and said, I forgot what I was saying. And I was able to tell them, well, this is where you're at. And they're like, wow, preacher. I was like, well, you told me to listen. This is where we're going. Okay, now you're right here. Let's start from right here and you finish telling me this story. I'm not a great listener. I'm not at all. I'm very weak in it. But one thing that I purposely have to do, knowing my limitations, is when she's talking, if I'm not careful, she gets less of my attention than anybody I minister to. And that's not right. As a pastor, that's not right. As a, as a husband, that's even worse. When your wife's talking, she wants you to listen, men. And maybe you've got to do what I do. And maybe you've got to say in your mind exactly what she's saying to you so that you can remember what she is saying. Because if she cares enough to tell you, you need to care enough to listen. And so we're not going to fix it. We're not going to jump to conclusions. Um, how, how many of y'all have gotten into a conversation and um, the whole reason you got into the conversation is you were waiting for them to finish so that you could say what you wanted to? Have you, you ever, y'all, y'all, y'all are with me now. Okay, heads are, bo- heads are bowing all over here. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Watch this. In conversation, you ever been in a conversation that it's like, I don't know why I talk to you. You don't, you don't listen to a word I say. All you're waiting for is your opportunity to speak. You like hearing your voice. Now, it, that's one thing when it's somebody at work or even at church. But what about it when it's at home? What about it when it's your mate? And what about when they can tell that you as a husband, I, Tony, that my dear wife 
she does not, she, she's trying to tell, she's trying to speak, and all I'm doing is waiting for her to hush her mouth so that I can tell her what she really needs to hear. Because see, I'm, I'm gonna fix her, I'm gonna straighten her out. I mean, in my mind, okay, you, you took the wrong turn there, you didn't do that right. Okay, if you just be quiet, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna fix you, because you need fixing. And I'm gonna tell you what you need to do. I mean, if you just, uh, and, and as soon as you be quiet, the more omniscience can verbalize himself. <laughs> and that's the way, are you ready, man? That's the way we come across, isn't it? That's right. And so if we're gonna have understanding, we need to make sure that we are being able to repeat back what they're saying, that we have genuine interest in what they're saying. Because now watch this, I want you to look at me, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand the principle, principle about affairs. In dealing with people that had, uh, had affairs, it had nothing to do with the body of the woman, it had nothing to do with the body of the guy. Hollywood makes it, yeah, where it, it, you know, it's, it's the steamy seductress and all this kind of stuff. In real life, the countless affairs that I've had to deal with and talk to people about had nothing to do with the body, had nothing to do with the looks. You know the sad thing, and this is from the outside, it's going to sound very judgmental, and, and, and I don't mean for it to, but I'm going to try to use it as a teaching tool for you, is the men that I've talked to that have gone and, and had affairs on their wife, from the outside looking at the, at, the, at, at the wife, as far as her, her appearance and the one that he wasn't had an affair, he didn't step up. He stepped down. And so when it comes to all this stuff, whether it's with a man or whether it's with a woman, and you look and say, how in the world could she go and, and have an affair with that guy? Because he listened. And whether or not he was really listening, he gave the appearance that he cared about what she was saying. And when the husband didn't have time for her, he was on Facebook or he was on one of those social media platforms and he was typing up note after note after note after note. And then when the man went to bed or husband went to bed, he's still writing things to them. And they're, 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 you, know how many, you know how many things have started off so innocently with dear ladies and some men? It's through the keyboard. Very innocent questions, thoughts, memories, reminiscing, guys from the past, people from the high school. Just talking and reminiscing. It's things they should have been doing with her husband, but see, he didn't have time to listen to her. He didn't have time to pay attention to her. But this guy, oh, hey, I remember when we were in school. I remember when we did this. I remember when we did that. And all of a sudden, it, it, was, it was the stroke of the keyboard that got her into the bedroom. And so learning how to understand our wives, learning how to listen to our wives, learning that we don't have to fix our wives, that they want our attention. She feels you're trying to understand her when you listen and can repeat back what she says. You don't try to fix her problems unless she specifically asks for a solution. You try to identify her feelings. Ask her, how, do, how does this make you feel? Am I, reading, am I reading you correctly that this is how this is making you feel? You never dismiss her feelings no matter how illogical they may seem to you. Has your wife ever responded with an emotion that you're sitting there going, golly, suck it up, buttercup. What in the world, really? If you say that to her, oh, there ain't a lesson for that. <laughs> you apologize and admit you were wrong. This is, I don't mean to be uncomfortable. I don't want to come across um, uncouth at all. But you cut her some slack during the monthly cycle. And for those that their wives had hit, an, hit, hit an age where the body is changing, it's devastating for them. Uh, it devastating to their hormones. It's devastating to their minds melt. It's not a slight against them. They are so out of whack that they cannot tell you which ends up. Taking a deep breath, understanding where they're at, understanding what they're going through, whether it's through the cycle or whether it's through the menopause and the change of life. Things that we want to be gruff about and we want to just, just, just dismiss and shrug off. These are very real things that our wives go through. And yet the only thing that we're concerned about is, well, I guess I won't get no loving tonight. She started. How do you think that makes her feel? What do you think goes through her mind? you got a wife that's hit maybe a particular age. Maybe she's going through early menopause. She's got emotions that she can't, she can't. What's wrong, honey? She doesn't know. It is, it, it, it is a horrific, ungodly, unruly, terrible, terrible, terrible time. Good heavens, she goes from one minute freezing to death to the next minute she's like flame on in one of these Marvel comics. <laughs> and if you've never gone through it, I mean, it is, a, it is a real thing. I mean, the hot flashes and all, this is not just stuff that they just threw out in these books and said, you know, this might happen. These are real things that happen. You going to go through it with her? 
You're going to make fun of her because of it. You let her know you appreciate her. You let her know you, you appreciate her sharing things with you and trusting you with information. You see something that needs to be done and do it without a lot of hassle or her telling you. You express appreciation for all she does. You pray with her. Uh, I think those are very beautiful things. P, we got, I got to close this. P, P is for peacemaking. C is for closeness. O is for, oh goodness, what was O for? O is for openness. 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 Okay, so close, closeness and openness, C-O-U. What is U? Understanding. P, peacemaking. She wants to say I'm sorry. And so what do men say? You want me to say I'm sorry? Okay, you're sorry. <laughs> Make a joke about it, right? Mm -hmm. Submitting yourselves, Ephesians 5.21, one to another in the fear of God. Acknowledging our wrongs. Finally, 1 Peter 3.8, be ye all of one mind, having compassion, one of another. Love his brethren, be pitiful, be compassionate, be courteous. There's a spirit that we should have when we go through conflicts. There's a, a spirit we should have within our homes when we have things that are going adversely. In your notes, conflict isn't bad. Good marriages will have lots of conflicts, and often bad, bad marriages will have very little conflict because they're never around each other. The difference is that in good marriages, they work out the conflict and use it as a way to connect more deeply. The challenges that you go through, they're going to, and, and Pastor Cofield, you say this all the time. It's just a tremendous, to me, it's just a tremendous quote. He's like, uh, the stuff that you're going through, and I can just, I can just hear it ringing out in, in church there. The things that you're going through, they're either going to make you bitter or they're going to make you better. I was like, man, that's good preaching. And then I started living life. And then I started having things happen. And I realized that of a truth, the things that you and I go through, they're either going to make us bitter or they're going to make us better. And you're going through a challenge in your marriage right now. You're going through a rocky season. You can quit. You can throw in the towel. You can, you can say this is it. You can go on to the next, next guy, got next girl. You can, you can do that. Or you can say, you know what? That's not in God's will. That's not in his word. That is not in his plan. I will fight for my wife. I will stand with my husband. We'll go through this thing together. We're going to go arm in arm. If one goes down, we both go down. I mean, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving her. I'm not leaving him. We're going to get through this thing. We're going to get through this thing together. And we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to try to, we're going to apply God's word to the situations of our marriage. And we're going to make a better marriage for his honor and his glory. When we come through this thing, the devil's going to be shamed and Jesus Christ is going to be exalted. Amen. We want God to take this, which the devil means for evil. We're going to watch God use it for the good. Peacemaking, learning to apologize, learning to apologize and meaning it. Find the root cause of what's going on. Um, I, I, have found, I have found this, and if I, I wish I could draw a little bit, but I can't. Um, I, I, have found, I have found this. Somebody was talking to me about counseling the other day, and they're like, man, it's, it's uh, as a matter of fact, I was in India. And the guy was like, because uh, I was sitting there talking with some men, and, and um, he, this, this gentleman was translating and all. And we finished, and he's like, I, can, I, I don't know how you do this. It's like, it's, it's incredible. It's like, I've been with these guys, and we've been dealing with these things, and, and uh, th this this is this has never come up. And I told him, I was like, what happens with us when we talk to people is we handle the surface stuff. Mm -hmm. I, was like, I was like, problems are, are, are very rarely, if ever, about the surface stuff. All the surface things that you're dealing with in marriage are because of something that is at the root of your life, your heart, and your marriage. And so we want to deal with all this subsequential fruit that hangs from the tree, but we never go beneath the ground to see what is really going on in the heart and the life of a person. I was dealing with a missionary, and the missionary was very uh, having trouble with another missionary. And there was just um, great angst between them, great tensions between them. There was um, not, not, not the kind of unity that Christian brothers ought to have. And so they're, they're having these feelings and going through these things and experience, just, uh, just some challenging, challenging, challenging stuff that they're going through. And, um, I, I looked at one of them, and I was like, why, why do you think you act like this? And he's like, I don't, I don't know. I, like, I said, just think with me. We were, we, I can still see we're at a restaurant. There was four of us there. And I was like, well, why, do you, why do you think you act like this? I said, why, why does this come up in your life? I'm like, because the way that you're acting is that you're trying to get out from underneath the shadow of somebody. That you are overcompensating because of insecurity that you have this this larger than life person in your life that you just can't seem to get out from under the shadow of 
and there's just so much insecurity that comes out and is coming across to other men that you need to be working with. I was like, what in the world is going on in your life? I was like, and I, I, I didn't know the guy. Uh, I knew of him, sweet man of God. He's a good guy. Don't, don't misunderstand, he's a good guy. I was like, can I, I said, I know nothing about your life. I was like, but can I ask you a question? Is there a possibility that you've got an older brother that could always do everything right and you're the younger brother that could always do everything wrong? You ever had a grown man look at you, turn white, and have tears start coming down his cheeks? His problem, the reason he responded and acted like a horse's rear end when it came to good men that were trying to help him, is it turned out that good brother has an older brother that was the preacher before he was ever called. He was the older brother that did everything right. He was the athletic one. He was the one that was praised. He was the one that the parents bragged on. And this other brother has felt like all of his life, and this guy's almost in his 30s, he's felt like all of his life that he's lived in his brother's shadow. What's at the root? What's going on in your life? Ma'am, what's going on in your heart? Sir, what's going on? I'm not talking about the little fruit that we want to pick on and sometimes that we talk about. If we could get into the subterranean level of your heart and really talk about your past, really talk about what's going on in your marriage, really talk about what's going on in your life, what's at the root of what's going on? And so when it comes to peacemaking, you know it's not about the dishes. Well, glory to God, if he'd wash the dishes once in a while, it's really not about the dishes. He bought you a dishwasher, amen? I mean, he thought he did something there, right? <laughs> that, that's a man's thing. Uh, you, what do you mean you, don't, you want me to help him with the dishes? I got you a dishwasher. I mean, everything in our house is automated. I mean, you don't do anything anyway. You see, we're now in loving disrespect. I mean, we're we on the wheel, brothers. But it's not about the dishes. See, I don't know how to express it anymore. I wish God would give me the words to but when we take all of this stuff with those, the problem. I mean, y'all raise kids. Anybody raise kids? Have kids? Okay. The ones that are on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, the new end of raising kids, it is the most awesome thing in the world. May you, may you enjoy every stage. Every stage brings blessings, and every, every stage will bring some, some challenges. But boy, it's just, it is wonderful, wonderful to raise children. Raising girls, man, I, I, I have really... Thank God for, for, for two daughters. I, that, I do. But i got to be honest with you. Raising girls. Drew, uh, uh, I've never really started drinking. <laughs> but I thought about it. I even asked God for, I even asked God for permission one day. <laughs> and he told me to go to a Mexican restaurant. I don't know. <laughs> All of a sudden, this emotional outburst. <laughs> I mean, you can't understand a word they're saying. <laughs> and you got to take time to let the emotions calm down, let the spirits come back, let the ears get open. And what is it that we parents ask? Fathers, what is the question that you ask your daughters? Honey, now what's wrong? Without even realizing it, you men and you ladies, you're God's counselors. Because how many times have you sat on a bed sat on the steps of your house, <coughs> waited, men, so some of y'all are, are starting to get this now, waited until you got through all the superficial and you started unpeeling the onion and you got to what the real problem was. If you'll take that same principle and you'll apply it to marriage, what will y'all, I don't want to know, and don't start saying it, okay, what were y'all fighting about before this conference? What, what is it that, that just was just a pain in the rear? I mean, it was just a thorn in the flesh. It was just, oh, my word. What were you yelling at each other about? And if we would go away from the fruit of, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. If we went beyond that, what, what is really, really the problem that made all that surface? And so when it comes to marriage, we're going to look at the men and say, no, let's be men, and let's set the example, and let's be the ones that seek peace within our homes. Let's be the ones that show our children how to have a humble spirit. Let's be the ones to model how to apologize. Let's be the ones that seek for peace and ensue it. Let's be the ones where it said, blessed are the peacemakers. Be the ones that can say, I'm sorry and mean it. 
as you go through this, she'll feel at peace with you when you let her vent her frustrations and hurts and don't get angry and close her off. Mm -hmm. You admit that you are wrong and apologize by saying, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? You understand her natural desire to negotiate, compromise, and defer, and you meet her halfway. You try to keep your relationship, relationship up to date, resolving the unresolved and never saying, oh, now watch this. How many times have we gotten frustrated? Maybe you don't do this. I'll, I'll, be, the, I'll be the one that I can throw stones at, okay? There's been times I've been so frustrated. And it's not a matter of not knowing. It's a matter of being so stressed and wanting to blame it on that and having so much on that I'm like, golly, what in the world? And I'm trying to fix this thing and she's trying to help me see it from her side. She, she wants me to understand. I don't want to understand right now. I want to fix this thing because I've got to handle this other thing and I've got my phone. My phone is beeping and blinging off the blooming hook. What in the world? And so how many times have I said, oh, Stacy, I, and what not? See, I try to be real spiritual about it. Honey, I love you. Forget it. We're just going to drop this. We'll handle it later. Just forget it. And then I say something like this. I've got things that I've got to take care of. And I'll, so how is she feeling already? Everything's more important than she is. Everybody else's problems are more important than her problems. All of a sudden, her husband doesn't have time for her. I'm not close to her. I'm not open to her. I have no understanding. I'm not seeing peacemaking. I have left her in a puddle called unloved. And then I want to know, what, 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 you know, how, how do we do this? Is, there, is, there, is everything okay? What's wrong with you? You everything, are you okay? Are everything okay? And then if they're not okay, I get mad at because they're not okay. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean they're not okay? Shouldn't it be okay? I mean, you ain't got no problems. I've been dealing with problems. You ain't got no problems. <laughs> Y'all looking at me, a bunch of <laughs> condescending <laughs> Baptists. <laughs> Shame on you. Because is that not, it's talk to me, amen or no? Is that not? Right. Yeah. Peacemaking. You forgive her for any wrongs that she's confessed. And even the ones that she doesn't confess, you forgive those too. You never nurse bitterness and always <laughs> reassure her of your love. Again, if you pray with her after hurtful times. You acknowledge where you messed up and you try to make it right. C, closeness. O is for openness. U is for understanding. P is for peacemaking. L is for loyalty. She needs to know that you're committed. Malachi says this in chapter 2, sorry, <coughs> chapter 2. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously. Notice it says take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hath uh, hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with, it, with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. The Bible says as men in Proverbs 5 that we're to drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. There should be a loyalty within our life that she needs constant, constant assurance that there's no other woman. There's no other woman. That means when we go by billboards, we're not looking. That means when things come up on Sports Center and you're watching, all you're doing is watching a ball game and they're going to pan to the cheerleaders. She's watching, watch, I want you to understand this, man, and I think you do, but in case you don't, when things come up on the TV, a Victoria's Secret commercial or the cheerleaders or those kind of things, you know she's watching to see how you respond to that. And she notices when you change the channel. Stacey and I have been married again for 30 years and we're talking about some of this stuff. And she shared something with me, and again, I, I try to share my thoughts with you because I want you to learn from them, and God's trying to help me build just a godly marriage. But she shared something even coming up on the web here that I, I've never, I never knew that she noticed. And she says, whenever those things come up on the TV, I notice how you change the channel. I'm sort of going, wow. So if you think that when you're walking down the boulevard or you're in the store and, and Sister Daisy Duke's there, if you're wondering whether or not she knows how you are responding to that, she does. And if, and I don't think we would have this in this room, but if you're unwise enough to be the man that would, would make comments about another woman to your wife, um, I just have to say, bro, there's a lot wiser things you could be doing, and I would definitely stop that one. You're making a. We've already got. We've already got enough pressure on these ladies. They can't go to. They can't go to Walmart. And buy anything without being confronted at the newsstand. With their imperfections. 
And the thing that is absolutely ironic about all of that is that even those ladies on those magazines, they don't look like that. We live in such a fantasy world that ladies are trying to chase something that's not even real. And so we've got to change this, and we've got to change that, and we've got to do this. And now, have you noticed, there is so much out there about how we've got to make our dear ladies look <coughs> whatever the certain way is. And they're so insecure, and I don't feel like I'm pretty, and I feel like I'm too heavy, or I feel like I'm too skinny. And if you need to lose weight, we've got enough things out there, we want to make you lose weight. If you need to gain weight, we've got things out there to make you gain weight. If you want to change your body part, there's all kind of ways of doing all that, because we've got ladies that are, are, are being inundated with, your, the way you are is not good enough. God help you. Um, I, I say that to you ladies. May God help you. The pressure that is on you to look like something that isn't even real. You can never catch up to Photoshop. And men, what we do is we show them our loyalty that, that uh, honey, you are absolutely perfect the way you are. I love the way you look. Well, I got these stretch marks. And you know what those stretch marks show me? They show me your love and dedication of carrying the children. Well, I've, got, I've gained a little weight. Yes, you have. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Are you with me? You love on them. Uh, and I'm trying to be very proper for you, but uh, you need to make her feel like she's sexy, that she's appealing, that she's beautiful, that she's wonderful. You need to make her just confident because this is the thing. How many, don't say anything. This would not be the time to say anything. But how many, how many have tried to tell their wife that they're beautiful only have their wife look back at them because they got so much of this stinking pressure on them and say, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. One of the saddest travesties that has hit our homes that has killed intimacy is ladies that have been barraged with so much that is so unreal that they look in the mirror and cannot stand to look at themselves. We are barraged with ladies that do not want their husbands now, their husbands, to see them nude. They're embarrassed. They're ashamed. They feel humiliated. And that's where you've been. You come in. And all this blooming garbage, this, this, this ungodly world has taken and dumped into the lives of our wives. We piece by piece by our love and commitment and touch and intimacy and closeness and openness and understanding and peacemaking and loyalty. We, we're, we're, we are flushing out of their systems all of the ungodly wrong things that this world is putting in. And if you got a garage and there's pictures there of motorcycles and the chicks that go with them, you need to go home. I would humbly encourage you. You're a grown man. I cannot tell you what to do. But if there are if there are calendars and photos and pictures and things like that that your wife sees those and you say <laughs> it doesn't bother her. It's killing her. And though she's trying to save the marriage by not saying anything, you take a part of her life every time she goes by and sees a, a, a lady and a body that she does not have, you've taken and sucked the esteem and the confidence out of her life because she's never, ever, no matter what she does, she's not going to match up to Photoshop. It is totally impossible. And so loyalty, is this making any sense? And so loyalty, we, we take and we put in our wives what society is trying to drain from our wives. And we put the confidence in them. You speak highly of her in front of others. I, I, I want to be gentle, but um, golly, I'm... Um, Preacher, is it okay if I take uh, just a few more minutes? I, I, and I know I've gone over and we got game time. I, I, I just want to share some things. We, we got a society that's killing our ladies. And the insecurity is over the moon. 
And when you look at her, you're putting back into her what society is taking out, and you're giving her the confidence that you're the only one that I want. And that's the reason you remove everything from your life that your wife feels as though she's got to compete with. Looking lustfully at other women, speaking down to them in public. I wasn't going to say it, but I'm just going to go and say this. I, I have been around men that have uh, been around other, other couples and folks and all, and uh, they've embarrassed their wife by commenting on their weight. Yeah, she, yeah, she gained a couple pounds there. Yeah. Nobody asked her about her thyroid. Nobody asked her about her stress level. Nobody asked her about her health. Nobody asked her about her gallbladder. Nobody asked her about what she was going through. And I've seen there where husbands thought it was just so cute to throw down on their wife with some type of insult to how they look. Men, when you get around other people, you brag on her. You talk about how wonderful she looks, how beautiful she is. You kiss her. You kiss her. You men could say amen right there. I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a punishment. You're not giving them to hell. Kiss her. Hold her hand. I'm not talking about being vulgar, but pat her, pat her on the fanny when she goes by. No, no, you understand this. We, we, we've looked at things, and we've allowed the world to, to, to fill us with all of its lies. You know what? You're married. You have my, my mom and dad, I, 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 we used to, you know, had a lot of kids around the house. We were like, God, you guys are just nauseous. You're making us sick. Okay, this is disgusting. Because, because you know, we're looking at, golly, I mean, that's like two, two ancient old people oh, kissing. And then you find out, you know, they were 37, and now I'm 50. I mean, you know, what am I? You, so, so they not, they, we, we, we kiss, and the kid's like, oh, I was like, hey, my teeth stayed in my mouth. <laughs> yeah. Pat on the fanny. Hold her hand. You say, oh, oh she won't like that. She's going to look at you and tell you she doesn't like that, and inside she's going to walk away going, mm, still got it, baby. <laughs> no, see, well, no, you didn't. see, we don't handle this stuff. But what your woman needs to do, because you put it in her, she needs to walk with pop. She needs to know she's got it going on. She needs to know that you are just absolutely ravished by her, think that she is the bomb diggity diggity dig. Are you with me? See, you understand this. You'll see a glow. You'll see, I'm not talking about embarrassing her or being vulgar. I'm not talking about that stuff, okay? I'm talking about openly holding her hand, hugging her, snuggling up, giving her a kiss, going by looking, smack on the rear, and she's going, hey, we're at church. <laughs> and then you look back and say, God told me to do it. <laughs> you see, even us talking like this, it helping some of you women. Men, you put that in her, and you let her know that she is the one that makes your heart beat. And she's the one that you are just absolutely ravenous about. It'll help her. You don't put her down in public. You don't put her down in front of the kids. You don't put her down when you're alone. You lift her up, you build her up, and you take out what society is trying to dump in. The last one is esteem. You esteem her. You want to honor, honor and cherish her. You want to lift her up. She's of great value. I'm not sure, Pastor, if you're the one that told us this. It's, this is not original. Um, it's not mine. I think I got it from Pastor Cofield. And I'll give you this as I close. And y'all have been very patient. In talking with people that are going to get married, we look at, we look at young people and we tell them, find somebody that you can live with. Find somebody that you can live with. You find that one person that you can live with. I want you to look at me and I want you to listen to this. Ready? We tell them, find the one person that you can live with. You need to look at them and let them know. I've not found the one person that I can live with. I found the one person that I can't live without. That is what you mean to me. I've not found somebody that I can live with. I'm going to treat her in such a way that she knows that I found the one person that I can't live without. That's esteem. That's honor. That's cherish. Father, help us. We sure do have a lot of the society and world that bombards, bombards everything your word teaches. Help us, God, to be the kind of men 
that bring security to our lives and affection to our lives and strength to them. All, all these things we talk about through the acronym of couple that, Lord, you would help us as we stumble through some of these things and, Lord, our old patterns of how we act want to jump in. We pray, God, that you would repel them and push them back. We might act in a godly way, a biblical way, a way that shows our lives that from the depths of our heart, from who we are, that we love them with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. We, we love them and them alone. Bless these couples. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, it was a little too easy on the Photoshop. I got another P that you need to give up to. That's called pornography. Mm. It's, it'll destroy your marriage. It'll absolutely destroy your marriage. Because she definitely can't live up to that smut. If you don't think it's available, they say it's just, it's uh, as big a problem with Christian men as it is non-Christian men. Yeah. It's biggest pro it's bi as big a problem in church as it out of church. I I don't want to believe that, but it might be. I uh, hope it's not in our church. But um, I said this up in Virginia when I did a conference and the pastor went off on it. I mean, really went off on it. He, he, he destroyed the song service and he started preaching and we just had an unusual service because he just he just took off on it. But I said this one statement, and I think it is appropriate. Is a man, you are the greatest man. Your heart is the greatest full-length mirror for your wife's self-image. Your conversation, your attitude, is the greatest full-length mirror for her self-image. If you see a wife going down looking like she's just nobody, she got that from looking in the mirror of your eyes. She, she got that from the mirror of your heart. And I am so guilty. I am so guilty. And you know, I think I'm gonna grow up after 45 years of marriage. I hope I grow up, you know, and mature a little bit, is that we really can destroy our mate's self-image. And I did that for the first eight years of our marriage because I was such an insecure son of a, I ain't gonna say it, of a person that drank a lot. I'm never gonna call him a drunk again because he's saved. But I just, I just had a critical attitude. And the reason I had a critical attitude is that I wanted company in the ditch that I was in. I was insecure. Critical people are insecure people. So man, you can't afford to be insecure. You gotta grow up. Or you got to grow spiritually, where you do not low rate her and her self image. Because I'm telling you, there's no greater mirror to her self image than your heart. Amen. What a great, great lesson. I took so many notes, I think I'm going to use these notes. But uh, that's a blessing. We're going to take a